I was like you once, a Christian, walking through life, struggling to shed those last remnants of unhealthy faith, holding you back from being the truth-affirming free thinker that you've always wanted. Well, don't despair and look no further, because I'm about to share with you the shortcut to apostasy you need to stop being a Christian in four easy steps. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Are you ready? Number one, the Bible. What we know about Jesus and his father, Yahweh, we know from the Bible. But is this collection of over 60 books the divinely inspired word of God? Or is it something else? Your pastor will tell you that the most famous books, the Gospels, are written by eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' life. But in truth, none of these authors claim to be eyewitnesses, or even to have met Jesus. Sure, the complete manuscripts we have include the familiar names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but all the early copies we have are fragments, without the titles. And when the 1st and 2nd century church fathers quote other books, they tell us the author's name. But when they quote these Gospels, they don't use any names at all. It sure looks like someone around 160 AD decided to attach plausible known names to the completely anonymous works in order to give them authority. While scholars have confidence that Paul the Apostle wrote seven books of the rest of the New Testament, those books that remain are anonymous, ambiguous, or far worse, blatant forgeries where the secret authors are signing someone else's famous name. The Old Testament doesn't fare any better. The first five books, the heart of the Torah, doesn't come from the pen of Moses, as Jesus professed. It is very clearly a literal stitching together of multiple holy documents from different times and different regions. The only serious debate here is how many books were merged. Three? Four? Ten? More? And those middle books? where you find most of the so-called prophecy? It turns out, generally the pre-Jesus predictions were written after the events actually happened, not before. And the things Jesus fulfilled can't be confirmed to have happened at all. More likely, early Christians created connections to make the New Testament link up to the Old Testament, like The Empire Strikes Back was written to connect to Star Wars. Sure. Evangelical apologists have come up with elaborate excuses for these problems that anyone can observe, but the fact that they make these excuses just affirms that the problematic observations are accurate. If you briefly set aside the spin of people who signed a Bible is Perfect pledge in order to keep their jobs and the post hoc excuses of devoted adherents, you'll discover that the book is incredibly human without any quality that requires divine inspiration. I won't even go into the bewildering lists of Bible contradictions, from the mundane to the damning. Christians try to tap dance around them, but something written by God shouldn't need this much fixing. Which brings us to number two, God. This is the year to let go of the idea that any answer is better than no answer. Embrace the adventure that is the reality of, we don't know yet. You may have been led to believe that God is necessary to create our universe out of nothing, which is a false start right there, because cosmologists don't actually propose there ever was nothing. The Big Bang kicked off our space-time, but matter and energy were around before that. In whatever sense, before that is a relevant concept pre-time. If something has to be timeless, it might as well be the energy we all agree exists. You may have been led to believe that God is necessary to create life. But starting with the Miller-Urey experiments in the 1950s, right up to RNA replication of the last decade, to prebiotic peptide research of 2020 and continuing now, the story of chemicals coming together to self-replicate, self-organize, and mutate to improve is slowly being revealed piece by piece. It's not complete, and may not be complete in my lifetime, but nothing supernatural is required to connect the dots. You may have been led to believe that God is necessary 
to explain the appearance of design in the natural realm. Well, the sun appears to rise in the morning and to fall at night, but we now understand that appearance is deceiving us. It is the earth that moves, not the sun. Just like a naive puddle that might be amazed how perfectly the whole fits his shape, so too we have the wrong perspective on design. Appearances can be deceiving. You may have been led to believe that God is necessary to explain consciousness. But while our understanding of how the property of consciousness emerges from brains is incomplete, the discoveries of neuroscience repeatedly demonstrate that our mental states are an effect of physical states. You may have been led to believe that God is necessary to explain free will. But if free will is the ability to have chosen otherwise, given the exact same circumstances, well, that hasn't been demonstrated either. Like the mechanics of a coin sorting machine, that we can make choices doesn't imply that our physical nature would have let us make other choices. You may have been led to believe that God is necessary to explain morality. But Jesus summed up morality as love your neighbor as yourself. That's just called empathy. Humans are a social species, and our survival advantage is working in groups. The optimum balance between helping ourselves and helping others isn't always clear, but we don't need a god to explain it or to sort it out. Realize that because God did it is a thought-free answer to any question. It's not a helpful explanation for any question. It's just an extra assumption that we don't need. Number three, hell. Okay, so God isn't necessary to explain anything. But what if I'm afraid of hell? Well, no matter what view of hell you go with, from eternal conscious torment to temporary separation from God to simple soul annihilation, the concept of sin is pretty clear. A gap between what God wants and what we do. But if the book tells us that a Christian God probably doesn't exist, and the universe doesn't need a theistic God to exist, then that gap of sin disappears with the deity. Without God, there's no sin. Without sin, there's no hell. Our survival instincts don't calm down immediately when we discover that the bump in the night was just a tree branch in the wind. So, just give your mind some time and the intellectual truth will eventually calm your nervous heart. And finally, number four, church. I get it. Your friends and family are in the Christian church, and the Christian church members are your friends and family. Most of your social eggs are in the church basket. But if your shared belief in God was the only thing holding these relationships together, it wasn't really much of a connection. And if certain Christians want to sever other connections because of a disagreement about one thing, there's not much you can do about it. But the church isn't the only place you can find community. Sure, there are even some groups centered around non-beliefs. But you don't need to think about that ever again if you don't want to. And if you can't stop, or you need to heal before moving on, we've got you. Church doesn't have a lock on tight relationships. There are communities centered around books, movies, sports, fitness, music, art, food, pets, games, science, technology, learning, whatever thing makes you excited. You can find your tribe, online or in person, once you feel safe doing that again. And that's it. That's all. Let go of the book, the God, the hell, and the church, and you'll stop being a Christian. As the song should have said, just stop believing. <laughs>